All right, good morning. Good morning. Um, you should have in front of you a set of notes for uh, Lesson 55, the process of preservation, the question of access and availability. Um, so I have decided that next Sunday is going to be the stopping point for this term of the class. So we're going to have a lesson this Sunday and then next Sunday on this topic, and then we'll be stopping um, this topic for the summertime so that I can study and do research and stuff for the next, <clears throat> uh, for when class resumes next September or at the beginning of next school year. Um, Norm and Beverly are going to be leaving, um, so we're going to have to be having some conversations about uh, how we're going to handle things with recording and all that sort of thing. Norm, I do, and Beverly, I do appreciate all the help that you guys have uh, given over the years to these projects. Um, the, without the recordings and stuff, it would not have uh, any real life or what have you beyond what's going on here at the church. So I appreciate that. It's going to be hard to replace you guys. Um, but we're going to do our best. Uh, hopefully you guys can still watch us online and uh, stay current with, with what's going on and stay in touch and in contact. Um, so uh, let me see, there was one other thing I was going to say, now I don't remember what it was. So Lesson 55, the process of preservation, the question of access and availability. Last week in Lesson 54, we looked at the simultaneous nature of preservation and corruption. We saw that both were occurring during the first century when the New Testament was being written. Since Lesson 48, we have been studying the process of preservation. In summation, we have observed the following from Scripture. Number one, God promised to preserve His Word. Number two, preservation was accomplished not by the preservation of the original autographs, but through a multiplicity of accurate, reliable copies that are just as authoritative as the originals themselves. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was the custodian of the words of God. During the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ and the local churches are the pillar and the ground of the truth. The, in the Old Testament, the copying process was overseen by the tribe of Levi. During the early part of the dispensation of grace, the office of the New Testament prophet identified, copied, and distributed the scripture. Once the gift of prophecy ceased, the job of preserving slash copying the text fell to Bible-believing Bible Pauline Grace Assemblies. Preservation and corruption were occurring at the same time. So that's about a, what, a five-point summary of what we've just seen uh, going through all that. Obviously, we said a lot more than that, but um, it's not my point to redo all that at this time. So from this we conclude that the Word of God is not preserved in a beautifully bound copy of a vellum scroll sitting on a library shelf somewhere. Rather, the Word of God is preserved in the open, in the hands of soul-winning, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching people. Bible-believing people use God's Word, and copies of the Word of God that they use get worn out. Thus, the necessity for faithful, reliable copies to carry God's Word from generation to generation. This preservation model implies that God's Word was available and accessible to God's people, not hidden away in the desert sand, under a rock, in a cave, or in an inaccessible library. Over the next few weeks, we will conclude our discussion of preservation for this term by looking at, issue, at, issues, at the issues of availability and access. So that's what we're going to be looking at in this particular uh, issue, or this particular lesson. So the idea here is that preservation does not occur in some ivory tower somewhere apart from the people that are actually using the scripture. It is the people that are actively using it, studying it, teaching it, preaching it that are going to be the ones that are primarily involved in the preservation thereof. So the first point, the question of availability and access. In this section, we will once again use Dr. William W. Combs' essay from, from the fall 2000 issue of the Detroit Baptist Seminary Journal titled The Preservation of Scripture to frame the discussion. So if you recall, uh, in the earlier parts of this term, we used Combs quite extensively for framing certain parts of the discussion. Okay, The pertinent portion is a section titled, Is Public Availability a Necessary Component of Preservation? Uh, uh, and this is actually located toward the end of Combs' essay. So before proceeding further, it is important to notice the circumscribed limits that Combs has placed upon the discussion. So this is just in an effort to be fair to what Combs actually says. Okay? He said, Dr. Combs begins the section by noting that many King James slash Texas Receptus advocates argue that the doctrine of preservation also includes the idea of public availability 
of the true text of Scripture. As proof of the notion, Combs offers the following quotation from Dr. should say quotations from Dr. Edward F. Hills. The first one is on page two. He says, quote, It must be that down through the centuries God has exercised a special providential control over the copying of the scriptures and that preservation and use of the copies. Now notice that, and the preservation and use of the copies so that trustworthy representatives of the original text are available to God's people in every age. So, according to Hills, how are they going to be available to people in every age? They're going to be available to people in every age through the use of what? The copying. Okay, through that, through that process of copying that we studied when we looked at the process of preservation. It's set, now, that, so that is how it's going to be made available. And then he says on page 86, uh, and this is, by the way, from the King James... Um, version defended, the Hills' book from 1956, he says on page 86, we must, have we must have preserved them, not secretly, in holes and caves, but in a public way, in the usage of his church. So that, he's saying, God, that's how God must have done it, okay? So, according to Dr. Combs, the sentiments expressed by Dr. Hills were... Uh, first expressed by Dean Bergen in the late 19th century, subsequent to the publication of the Westcott and Hort Greek text, as well as the revised version in 1881. Bergen stated the following in the traditional text of the Gospels in 1896. He said, quote, I am utterly unable to believe, in short, that God's promise has so entirely failed that at the end of, 18, at the end of 1800 years, much of the text of the Gospel had in point of fact to be picked by a German critic out of a waste paper basket in the, in the convent of St. Catherine, and that the entire text had to be remodeled after the pattern set by a couple of copies which had remained in neglect during 15 centuries and had probably owned their survival to that neglect, whilst hundreds of others had been thumbed to pieces and, and had and had bequeathed their witness to copies made from them. So what Bergen is identifying there is the idea that the text, that the text of the New Testament is preserved not in a few manuscripts that no one knows about or have fallen into neglect because they're not being used. They are being preserved through the text that is in use in the churches throughout that duration of time. Okay, that is Bergen's main contention. Hills is obviously saying something similar almost 100 years later in the 1950s and 60s. So, in other words, according to the textual model embraced by Drs. Westcott and Hort, Bergen reasoned that, quote, God kept hidden from the church the true text of the Word of God uh, from sometime around the 19th century until the discoveries of Codex Sinaiticus and Vanicatus in the 19th centuries. And that's from Combs, page 42. So the point here is, how, are we, how is this preservation going to happen? Is it going to happen through the, through, through the Word of God being stored away somewhere and, and out of use and not being used by people? Or is it going to be preserved by people who are Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Bible-preaching people who are going to have access and, and it's going to be in use by these people throughout the history of the dispensation of grace. Now, of course, that Bergen never says the history of the dispensation of grace. That's just me saying, that, saying it that way. So there's, a, there, so there's two different schools of thought here. And where we're going to start the next term of the class uh, is by laying out what the two different schools of thought are in detail, okay, about, the, uh, about how this should be done. For right now, we're just trying to establish the fact that there are many that would say that preservation is going to lead to the view that it had to be available and accessible to people throughout the history of the church, okay? And when I say that, I don't mean the organized Roman church. I mean the, the history of the dispensation of grace to Bible-believing people. So while I personally, bottom of page two, while I personally find the reasoning of both Hills and Bergen to be sound, given the parameters of the debate, Dr. Co Dr. Combs, not surprisingly, takes exception to it. Firstly, Combs views the expression, the true text, as a low, as, quote, loaded language, that distorts the view of those who do not believe that either the TR or majority text is necessarily the closest text, text to the autographs. Uh, 
Dr. Combs maintains that the Texas Receptus Majority Text and Westcott and Hort Text all accurately convey the message of the autographs. So his position is again that they all are what? He, that, that all of them are, are the line of preservation, whether it's the majority text, the received text, or the Westcott and Hort text. Okay? Therefore, the Texas Receptus majority text, Westcott and Hort text, as well as more recent editions of the Nestle Alon text and the United Bible Society's text can all rightly be called the true text because they accurately convey the message of the autographs. Okay? Now notice what, where is the emphasis of Combs? The emphasis on Combs is on the message of what? The, the, the message of the autographs. So according to Combs, there are no substantive differences between the various Greek texts listed above that affect doctrine. So Combs is saying that none of the differences affect any what? Any doctrine. Okay, he says about this quote, uh, this is his quote about that. He says, It has already been argued that doctrinal differences among Christians do not stem from differences in Greek texts or English versions. Many of us simply prefer the more recent editions of the Greek New Testament because we honestly believe that they represent a text that is somewhat more accurately representative of the autographs. Okay? So he's saying that the reason why Christians disagree about doctrine has nothing to do with what? It has nothing to do with Greek. It has nothing to do with Greek text. It has nothing to do with uh, translations. Um, that that's not why Christians disagree over doctrine, according to what he's saying here. Okay. Now I'm sure you guys already know that I don't agree with Combs about that. All right. If Combs believes, so this is my comment now. If Combs believes that more recent editions of the Greek New Testament are better representatives of the autographs, which is what he just said in the quote there from page 42, okay, um, then he must by default believe that there are verses in the Textus Receptus and the King James Bible that should not be there. So if, if, if the Nestle Alon United Bible Society's texts are in fact better witnesses to the, to the original, as, as Combs is arguing, then he is going to have to by default say that there are verses in the King James Bible that shouldn't what? That shouldn't be there. Big sections of verses, I might add, like the end of Mark. Uh, Mark chapter nine, ver or 16, verses 9 through 20, and other verses that are just totally not, uh, that, that are taken out of modern versions because the critical text editions do not support those verses or do not view those verses as being, uh, as having been in the original, okay? So how the, so uh, I'm halfway through that point. How the presence of extra verses does not affect doctrine is beyond my ability to comprehend. I don't understand how he can say this, okay? Because if, if Mark 16 shouldn't be in my Bible, then I don't understand how that doesn't affect any doctrine. Especially when you read the contents of Mark 16 and, 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 what, and what Mark 16, 9 through 20 has to say. The notion that the debate over the inclusion or exclusion of Mark 16, 9 through 20 does not affect any doctrine is wishful thinking on the part of Combs. I don't agree. Even, even Dr. Bollinger ha goes on for a long time in the Companion Bible giving all of the evidences for why Mark 16, 9 through 20 should be in the Bible. And it is solely on the basis of two texts alone that those verses are argued to be uh, not scripture or not, or, or not in the text. Okay, so. Um, the idea that, that, that there are no doctrinal differences of any kind based upon textual differences and or translation um, is, not an, is not anything that I'm able to, to, uh, to understand how that could be the case. Okay? And I think you'll see a little bit later on here that this, this becomes a, a problem in a slightly different way. So, consequently... Combs' first objection to the notion that preservation includes the, I don't know, circle notion, that second notion, that shouldn't be two times in one sentence. So consequently, Combs' first objection to the notion that preservation includes, let's say, the idea of public availability is a moot point.
The verses and readings that Combs thinks are the best representation of the original were not made available to the body of Christ until the 19th century, according to the critical theory. The critical theory says that these readings, these correct readings based upon the oldest and best, are not recovered to the church until when? Until the 19th century, okay? Codex, the first part of Codex Sinaiticus is found by Constantine Tischendorf in 1844. There are readings in the critical text and in modern versions that, that the only textual support that they have is Codex Sinaiticus. There literally is no other witness to the reading contained in the critical text other than that one codex. And it wasn't found according to the traditional understanding of these things until he finds it in 1844. And that, and that part time, he only finds like 43 leaves of the Codex and brings them back with him to Germany. He goes back three times, and in 1859, he takes the rest of the Codex with him back. And, uh, he takes it back with him to uh, St. Petersburg, um, Russia. Um, and that's where the Codex resided until it was purchased by the British Museum until in like 1933 or something like that. So there are, there are readings in the critical text that supports uh, modern versions that were literally not known to anyone until this codex was recovered or found by Tischendorf. Okay? So if you go back to the point, the verses and readings that Combs thinks are the best representation of the original were not made available to the body of Christ until the 19th century according to the critical theory. Therefore, the objections that the critical theory and its, and its implications voiced by Bergen and Hills on the grounds of public availability still stand. So in other words, there are readings in these that no other, there are readings in Codex Sinaiticus that no other Codex, Papyri, anything would support. And then those are then taken along with Vaticanus and used to adopt an entirely different text. Okay, and what Combs is saying, and not just Combs, but others who would argue similarly, is that these readings are a more accurate representation of the original text. The problem with that is no believer used any of these readings until they were recovered in the 19th century. So that I, I have a problem with that, as does Bergen, based on the quote, as does Hills. So, <clears throat> go on to the next point. <clears throat> Whether you agree with that or not, does everybody understand the point? Okay. Combs' second objection to the notion that preservation requires public availability centers on the fact that the scriptures make no such proclamation. He says, quote, <coughs> Second, the belief that God must have made the scriptures publicly available at all times has no basis in scripture itself or in the transmission history of the text, end quote. So, while, so look at the next point. While it is true that there is no single verse in which God explicitly states, I will preserve my word by making it publicly available, the totality of the verses that we have looked at regarding the process of preservation not only imply availability to God's people, but also use by them. So if you're looking for a verse that's going to say, I'm going to preserve my word through public availability, you're not going to find that verse. But if you take all of the verses that we've established and studied over the last six to, six to ten weeks, the idea that God's word is available to God's people is clearly supported by all of those all of those passages. Okay, the idea that a bunch of synagogues all throughout the first century Mediterranean world, where Paul is going on his apostolic journeys, all have copies of the Old Testament Scripture, would support the idea that the copies are plentiful and widely what widely distributed and available for people to use. We saw Jesus in Luke four. In Nazareth with a copy of the book of Isaiah, we saw the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8 going back to Ethiopia with a copy of the book of Isaiah. Okay? So the scriptures are widely distributed and available through the process of preservation, uh, through the copying process that we have studied as part of this class. So 
I, while it is true that there's not an, a verse that explicitly states that, the totality of the verses would seem to suggest that God's Word is not only available to God's people, but it is in use by them. Combs states the following to buttress his point from above. He says, quote, In fact, Scripture itself records an instance where part of the Old Testament was not available for a period of probably more than 50 years. When the temple was being repaired in the 18th year of the reign of Josiah, we read of the finding of the book of the law by uh, Hilkiah, the high priest. And you could read about that in 2 Kings 22 and in 2 Chronicles 34. So he says, uh, though it is not clear whether the book of the law is a reference to the entire Pentateuch or just the book of Deuteronomy, it is undeniable from the reaction of Josiah that there had been general ignorance of the law for some time. Josiah says, our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book. According, according to Deuteronomy 31, Moses wrote down the law and gave it to the Levites to place, uh, to place it beside the Ark of the Covenant. It is probable, now watch what he says here, it is probable that normal access to the scriptures was through what? was through copies, since the ark and presumably the law were placed in the most holy confines of the temple. So what I think we need to do, let's, let's go back and get set, go back and get 2 Kings 22 in one hand and get 2 Chronicles 34 in the other. Get 2 Kings 22 in one hand and 2 Chronicles in the other. 2 Kings 22 and 2 Chronicles 34. All right, 2 Kings 22. So the, the, the passages that, that Dr. Combs is referring to, oh darn it, I just lost the other one, are, are, are right here. Okay, verse 8. And Hilkiah, and Hilkiah the high priest, said unto Stephen the scribe, uh, sorry, Stephen, Saphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Stephen, to, to, Saphan, and he read it. And Saphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered, the, have gathered the money that was found in the house and delivered it into the hand of them that do the work and have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Saphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Helikiah the priest hath, discovered, hath delivered me a book. And Saphan read it before the king. Okay? So that's, uh, and then you, if you come over to 2 uh, Chronicles 34. So uh, 2 Chronicles 34, verse 14. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Helikiah the priest found, the, found, a, found a book of the law of of. Yes, sorry, found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. So the question there is, is it just one of the books of Moses or is it what? All of them. That's at least that's a question that you, you could obviously debate from that verse. And Hilkiah answered and said uh, to Sephon the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of of the Lord, and, and, Hel and Helikiah delivered the book to Saphon, and Saphon carried the book to the king, and brought the king word back again, saying, all that, was, all that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money, and found in the house of the Lord, and hath delivered into the hand of the overseers, and to the hand of the workmen. Okay? So, we understand, I just want you to read the verses that, that, that Dr. Combs is referring to when he's making his point. Okay? So he's saying, go back to the quote, He's saying that based upon these verses, uh, Israel did not have access to what? To law. To law or, and, and it, it was not available uh, to them. So let's finish the quote. Okay, So I'm at the very bottom of page 3. He, he says again, It is probable that normal access to the Scriptures was through copies since the Ark and presumably the law were placed in the most holy confines of the temple. During the reign of Manasseh, true Israel, true Israelite religion was practically wiped out. 
And then he says at the top of page 4, And it may well be that all copies of the law were destroyed, thus explaining the general ignorance of the law until it was discovered during the reign of Josiah. Okay? So does everybody understand what he's, he's using those verses to say that the scriptures do not teach preservation or, or do not teach that availability and access are part of what? Preservation. Okay? So look at the next point. First, note how Combs inadvertently advocates for the process of preservation we have outlined in this class. He acknowledges that the originals were placed in the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and later in the temple. He then states that, quote, normal access to the scriptures was through the copies, was through copies. While it is true that under the reign of Manasseh, Israel did not fare well spiritually, I don't need a but there, I don't think, there is a big difference between practically wiped out, as Combs acknowledges, and entirely wiped out. Therefore, his statement, it may well be that all copies of the law were destroyed, is complete speculation. Does Combs actually believe, does, does Combs actually believe that the only copy of the book of the law in all of Israel was the one found by Helikiah the priest during the reign of Josiah? Just because the word of God may have been absent from the priests and the king for a period of time does not mean it was unknown or unavailable to believers within Israel. Okay, it does not prove the point that he is trying to uh, that he is trying to, to to state. Come over with me to Romans chapter eleven. Another pretty bad time for Israel was during the reign of Ahab. <clears throat> Remember, Elijah says, "Am I the only one that hasn't won?" Bow the knee to Baal. You remember that, that, that account back there from the Old Testament, right? R Romans chapter 11, verse 4. Romans chapter 11, verse 4. Um, actually, look at verse 2. He says here, But, but um, <clears throat> hast not cast away his people which he foreknew? Wote ye not? What the scripture saith of Elias, that's Elijah, when he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek what? My life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of what? Now, just think about that. Why do you think, if they're not going to bow their knee to the image of Baal, why do you think they're not doing that? Because they have the Word of God and they're acting in faith that they know they're not supposed to have any other gods before, God, before Jehovah. Okay? So, so go to the next point. Romans 11.4. The reign of Ahab was another terrible time for the truth of God's Word in, Israel, in Israel's history. Yet Paul says that as many as 7,000 Israelites had not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. It is nothing but pure speculation on the part of Combs that 2 Kings 22, 8 through 10 and 2 Chronicles 34, 14 through 18 means, mean that God's word was not available to anyone outside of what was found in the temple. In fact, I would argue that it would be contrary to God's purpose and preservation to allow his word to be diminished to only one available witness. Look at, look at uh, Psalm 68, 11. Psalm 68, verse 11. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that what? Published it. So, I don't... It's my personal private opinion that I don't believe that the verses there prove that the scriptures in Israel were diminished to only one witness or only one copy. Okay? They had already been copied. They had already been published. They had already been distributed. And they were widely available just because the king and the priest and so forth chose to ignore it for a time doesn't mean that there weren't people in Israel that had access to it okay if they have listen they have access to that thing all the way through the captivity they're reading that thing David Daniel is reading it Ezra comes back from captivity Ezra and Nehemiah bring it back with them after the captivity okay so um, it, to me, th this, this line of argumentation doesn't prove the point, okay? Daniel B. Wallace on public accessibility. 
Dr. Combs is not the only one to take exception with the notion that accessibility is critical to the process of preservation. In the 1990s, Dr. Daniel B. Wallace published a series of essays in scholarly journals in which he challenged the corollary of accessibility. Um, so that was, in, uh, that was uh, in an essay called Wallace, the Majority Text Theory, 18, uh, page uh, one, yeah, 188. Sorry. In his 1994 essay, uh, The Majority Text Theory, History, Methods, and Critique, Wallace argues that accessibility is inferred by those supporting the majority text position. He says, quote, hence, the majority text position is based on a corollary of accessibility of a corollary preservation of a particular dogmatic stance, verbal inspiration. So remember when we talked earlier, a few weeks back, a few months back about the corollary between preservation and inspiration? Now he's saying that the idea of accessibility is based on a corollary, based on a corollary, based on what? A dogmatic stance on inspiration. That's, that's what Wallace is saying here. Wallace's comments from 1994 were preceded by his 1992 essay titled Inspiration, Preservation, and New Testament Textual Criticism in the Grace Theological Journal. In this essay, Dr. Wallace quotes Dr. Edward F. Hills and offers the following comment in response. Wallace says, quote, God must preserve this text not secretly, not hidden away in a box for hundreds of years or moldering unnoticed on some library shelf, Excuse me, but openly before the eyes of all men through, the continu through continued usage in his church. Preservation is therefore linked to public accessibility, according to Wallace. Okay? Well, that's Wallace quoting Hills. So I was trying to make that. So when you see there, Hills 31. Wallace is there quoting from Hills's book, page 31, and then I gave you the ultimate citation there from Wallace, who's quoting, uh, who's saying that on page 30. Okay. The same essay contains an entire section titled "Public Accessibility of a Pure Text is a Theological Necessity." In this section, Dr. Wallace argues against the notion of accessibility on the following grounds: Number one, the majority text was not available until 1982. Okay? Number two, the Textus Receptus. Now let's just stop there for a minute. There is another position by those who would argue for what is called the majority text, and the first edition of the majority text is not published until 1982. Okay? Now, we will talk more about the, the details of this later on, but to me, is that, is that as much of a problem, if not more, than this one? Look, if you're going to think, think this is a problem, then the idea that the true text of the New Testament was not available until 1982 and when Farstead and Hodges printed it is also a bit of a what? is also a bit of a problem if you're going to be fair, right? So this is, this is known as the official majority text position. You need to understand that the majority text position is a particular view. Some people, when they write, they will just talk about the majority text in the sense of, when, when they say that, they're not talking about a particular printed edition. They're talking about the majority of the Greek manuscripts. Now, I'm, I'm sort of hesitant to say too much more about that because I don't want to confuse you, but the Texas Receptus position, we, we, I mentioned this to you earlier, so I'll just, I'll just line this out. The Texas Receptus position includes the majority of the Greek manuscripts. Okay? It also includes the lectionaries. It also includes the, er, the church father, the quotations of the church fathers. And it also includes early versions or early translations. Okay? So a true, a, a true majority text position is only going to look at what? The majority of the Greek manuscripts. The Texas, Receptus, the Texas Receptus position looks at this. It does look at the Byzantine witness, the majority uh, of the Greek manuscripts. 
but it also looks at the lectionaries, church father uh, quotations from the church fathers, patristic quotations, as well as early translations in determining what the text should say. Okay? So the critical theory is looking primarily at Greek manuscripts. The majority text position of Farstad, Hodges, Pickering, and others is looking primarily at the majority of just the Greek manuscripts. And they'll talk about, they will put all these things through a mathematical calculator and aggregate all this stuff out. That's what this position is going to do. This position is looking at what is, what is the total witness here of what's available for us to know what the text should say. And they will, they will look at not only Greek, they will look at other witnesses in trying to understand uh, what, what the te- uh, trying to understand the, 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 how, what the reading should be and, and so on and so forth. Okay? But the majority text position that uh, so go back to the notes. He says, in this section, Dr. Wallace argues against the notion of accessibility on the following grounds. Number one, the majority text was not available until 1982. When Wallace says that, he is particularly meaning to critique Hodges, Farstad, I might spell that wrong, I don't remember, and Pickering, and a couple other people that in the late 70s into the 80s and 90s were arguing for a a majority text position. So when he makes that statement there, he is aiming that statement at these guys right here particularly. Okay? And then in the next statement, he's he's gonna talk about these guys down here, the Texas Receptus people. So let's read that, start that over again. In this section, Dr. Wallace argues against the notion of accessibility on the following grounds. Number one, the majority text was not available until 1982. Number two, the Texas Receptus differs from the majority text in almost 2,000 places. Okay? So, does this text differ from the pure majority text of Farstad and Hodges? Yes. Yes. Okay. And three, no one had access to anything other than the majority text for 350 years between 1560 and 1881. And number four, the majority text was not readily available in Egypt for the first four centuries. So we will get into a lot more of that later on, but I have also included out of, if you go to page 9, if you flip back to page 9, you will see that I've included the entire, I've reproduced for you there in Appendix A, the entire statement of uh, Dr. Wallace uh, on the issue of public accessibility. Okay? So, if you go back to page 5. It is important to note that many of Dr. Wallace's comments, okay, I don't like that sentence. It is important to note that many of Dr. Wallace's comments are Dr. Wilbur Pickering's and the majority text position. Okay, that's true, but I don't like the way that's worded, so I need to work on the wording there. It is also instructive to note that Dr. Wallace points out many of the differences between the majority text and the Texas Receptus are theologically significant. Quote. He's saying that there's the, that you need to think about this. Okay? Wallace is saying that these differences between the majority text and the Texas Receptus are, are theologically significant. Yet, they've already said, particularly Combs has already said, that none of, the, none of the differences in doctrinal belief have anything to do with what? The textual differences. And he's including yet. And he's including all of, he's including the Textus Receptus, the majority text, the, the text of Westcott and Hort, as well as the Nestle Alon and the United Bible Society's text. Combs was when he made that statement. So my point is, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it that, not, that there's no doctrinal differences based upon textual issues, but then, have, but then turn around and say, but there are 2,000 theological differences between the majority text and the Texas Receptus. Yeah. 
So either, either there are or there what? Either there are or they aren't, or, or there aren't. You can't, you cannot have this both ways, okay? So it is important to note that Dr. Wallace's comments are, I don't like that sentence, so I'm going to go to the next one. It is also instructive to know that Dr. Wallace points out many of the differences between the majority text and the Texas Receptus are theologically significant. Yet we are expected to buy the notion that there are no theological differences at all between the critical text and the Texas Receptus. The double standard here is quite glaring. Okay, you can't say there's 2,000 text, there's 2,000 theological differences here, but when you when you compare the when you compare the different readings between the Texas Receptus and the critical text, none of those impact theology at all. I'm sorry, that's not going to work. Okay. So let's go to the conclusion. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. <clears throat> I actually gave you the verse. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. <clears throat> For this commandment which I command thee this day... It is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou should sayest, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very what? nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thine heart that thou mayest what? That thou mayest do it. So look at your notes. Dr. Kent Brandenburg wrote an entire chapter on this passage for the book Thou Shalt Keep Them, A Biblical Theology of Perfect Preservation of Scripture. Regarding these verses, Dr. Uh, regarding these verses, Brandenburg writes in part, quote, These words in their context teach the doctrine of general availability of all the words of Scripture for every generation. Every generation of Israel needs the word for the purpose of reviewing, remembering, believing, and practicing them. In Deuteronomy, they were told to remember them 14 times in order not to forget his words nine times. Verses 11 through 13. Look at verse 11. He says, uh, For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is what? Not, not hidden. Verse 12, it is not where? It, it is, it, it, well, yeah, it's, I missed one. Excuse me. It is not far off. It is not in heaven. Verse 13, neither is it where? Beyond the sea. Beyond the sea. So go back to your notes. Verses 11 through 13 are negative and tell the reader what the commandment is not. Negatively, the commandment is not hidden, nor is it far off. The Hebrew words translated not hidden appear in many different ways in the King James Bible, but together they essentially mean accessible, hence knowable. Words that are hidden might be in a library or buried in some ruin or desert. These qualities, not hidden, not far off, certainly give a tangible quality to the commandment written down and available in writing. Words far off could be those <clears throat> for which there is no available copy. They could be found in a museum, in a display box, in one location where the only people who could see it would be able to travel a great distance to do so. They could also just reside in heaven, which the text goes on to dismiss as a valid possibility. God guaranteed access to the words, uh, God guaranteed access to the words would not require passing over the sea. The negative section of verses 11 through 13 overrules unavailability, since hearing and doing is dependent on accessibility. The text promises that the words will not be inaccessible. In contrast, verse 14 is positive. It states what the word is. Look at verse 14. Now remember, we saw in 11 that it's not hidden, neither is it far off, it's not in heaven, it's not beyond the sea in 13, in 12 and 13. And then 14, it says, but the word of God, what? Is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thine heart that thou mayest what? That thou mayest do it. Positively, the word is nigh. It's close. The sufficient proximity of the people to the word is revealed by the further description of in thy mouth and in thy heart in verse 14. 
The promises repeated in the New Testament passage, uh, in the New Testament passage mentioned earlier, Romans, Romans 10. Paul quotes this in Romans chapter 10, verses 6 through 8. Mouth and heart express close proximity. They express intimacy. They leave no room for an argument against the truth of availability of God's words as a possible excuse for unbelief and disobedience. If it wasn't near, they could just say what? Well, we didn't have it. You can't hold us what? You can't hold us accountable. You didn't give it to us in a way that we knew what it was. Okay? The reason for availability or accessibility is that one might hear it and do it, or that one mayest do it in verse 14. Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 through 20, express the seriousness of why availability matters. Go to verse 15. See how I have set before thee this day life and good and death and what? And evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou go, goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall, utter, that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land uh, whither thou passest over, uh, over Jordan to go to possess it. I will call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may what? May live. Now we could read further. Uh, and, and we should get verse 20. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, that thou mayest obey his voice, that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So, life, good, and ability to please God are dependent upon it. If Israel is going to have life and please God, what are they going to need to have? They're going, to need to have the word, they're going to need to have the words of the commandment. Okay? The potential consequences of unavailability, cursing, and loss of blessing stress the necessity for availability. The expression of punishment adds to the guarantee that the words will be accessible. God is holy and just. He is merciful. There is a clear intimation in the blessing and curses that a holy, just, and merciful God will make sure that um, with, so much de with so much dependent on accessibility of His words, He will make sure they are what? Available. From this, we can see that Dr. Brandenburg deduces the following logical syllogism. He says, major premise... If it is necessary that his words are available to every generation, then a holy and just God will ensure their availability. Minor premise. It is necessary. Conclusion. Therefore, God's words are available to every generation. Now, does everybody, whether you agree or disagree with them or not, does everybody see how he gets to that conclusion? Okay? So if God's going to hold Israel accountable to this stuff, and their very life and existence in the land is going to be dependent on it, is God obligated as a just, holy God to make sure they have access to His Word? And so He provided a mechanism. He gave them a way of, of making the copies. He gave them a way to distribute it so that they could have it, so that they could have access to it. It is consistent with the believing viewpoint to maintain a belief that God's Word will be available to every generation. Come over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 2. Uh, hang on a minute. It might need to be 2 Peter. It's 2 Peter. We need to make a note of that, Dave. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2. That thou, may, that thou may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Peter's readers cannot be mindful of the words which 
which were spoken before by the holy prophets, unless they are available and accessible to them. Do Peter's readers need to know that according to Peter? Okay. The call to remembrance assumes the availability of the Old Testament. Go to Jude 17. Jude 17. Jude verse 17. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles and of who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. The words of the apostles spoken before Jude wrote are not part of uh, the words of the apostles spoken before Jude wrote are not part of the written record. This is hmm, that doesn't sound right to me. They should be part. They are part, I think. I'm gonna have to check that quote, um, Dave. So will you mark that one, please? This not only strongly implies that Jude has the words of the apostles. <clears throat> The New Testament writings completed at that point in time, but also unequivocally states that unequivocally states that believers to which he writes had these words. What? How are they going to remember them if they don't what? If they don't have them? So Dr. Gary Lamore concludes his chapter in "Thou Shalt Keep Them" on the availability of scriptures with the following paragraph. He says, "Quote." The apostles, in quoting the Old Testament, never questioned whether they had available the true Word of God. The apostles acknowledged that what others had written in the New Testament was also God's Word. At, at the time, Second Peter and Jude, at the time of Second Peter and Jude, the New Testament authors were not looking to verify what they had of the Old Testament as the true Word of God. Like all believers, they gladly received it. They were not looking for a lost Bible. God in His providence has seen to it that His Word has passed from one generation to the next. The apostles received as authentic what they read and quoted from the Old Testament prophets as it had been passed on to them. True believers today should do the same thing. The correct and obvious interpretation of these texts and the implied belief of the apostles was that they had every word of God preserved and available to them. Based upon legitimate application of the text, the Lord's church, the Lord's true churches today have available to them only the have available to them not only the words of the Old Testament prophets, but also the words of the New Testament apostles and other New Testament writers. The teaching of availability of every word of Scripture has been a has been and continues to be a strong basis for opposing the attacks on the teaching of Scripture by the apostles. Okay? For those who pay attention to the details, it is clear that God chose to preserve His Word in a manner, i.e. copies, that allow access to God's Word by the common man. Consequently, the musings of Combs on the subject of public availability and preservation appear to be designed to serve the position that he has already determined is the correct one. Availability and access to the Scriptures are a logical conclusion of the process of preservation outlined in Scripture. God's Word was preserved through the dynamic of people handling it, not in one copy sitting on a bookshelf for five to one thousand years. That is not the way God preserves His Word. He preserves His Word by being in the hands of Bible-believing people, and those people are charged with the responsibility to execute God's purpose. So, in summation, I think that what we've seen about preservation does suggest that God's Word is available to people, in the, and, and that would be consistent, right? With, with Psalm 12, 6, and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt preserve them, O Lord, thou shalt keep them from this generation, how long? Forever. So the idea of availability and accessibility of the Word of God is not something that is an option. Okay? It's not something that God sets out and says, oh, well, you know, maybe I'm going to give you my word, maybe I'm not. He says, not only did I give it to you, I gave you a mechanism where it could be distributed, and you're going to be accountable to it, and it's not going to matter whether you have the original or whether you have a third, fourth, or fifth generation what? Copy. Okay? Okay.
So the, the, text of the, the, the text of Scripture is, the, the way the Bible would teach you to think about the issue is not to look for the oldest one sitting on a shelf somewhere that nobody's used in 1,500 years. It would be to look at what is out there among the people and being used, being believed, being preached, being copied, being distributed, being disseminated. In 1901, in 1901, Bullinger wrote an essay for the Things to Come Journal where he quotes a church historian, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, talking about the Pauluseans. And he talks about the Pauluseans being in Byzantium, being distributed into Europe through persecution, and being the ones that had a primary interest in copying and distributing the Word of God. Okay? That's Dr. Bollinger in 1901, Things to Come Journal, saying that. And views himself, I might add, as the successor of that movement. And the readership of his journal as being the successors of what was started back there by those Pauluseans. Okay? Now that is a topic that I'm going to develop for you in much more detail when we resume the second part of the class. So I think you can see here that I'm sort of teetering on saying too much and going into a new topic that we're not going to have time to adequately talk about before we, we, we take a break for the summer and, and, and you know sticking to what we just need to finish up here for this particular term. So, um, accessibility I think is a perfectly legitimate thing when it comes to the issue of preservation and I think it is consistent with the verses that would teach you to think about it in that way. So, we are actually done two minutes early. <laughs> So you guys can go enjoy an extra cup of coffee or whatever it is that you want to enjoy. And uh, we'll be back here next Sunday for the end of this term. Okay? And Tom, we're going to have to talk about what we're going to do after that. So thank you.